Hi, everyone. Uh, welcome back to the SITP Monday Colloquium. Today, we are very happy to have Professor Liam McAllister from Cornell, and he's going to tell us about small cosmological constants in string theory. Over to you, Liam. Thanks. Uh, thanks so much for giving me the opportunity to speak. It's uh, my privilege to be able to tell you about the work that we've been doing on small cosmological constants. Let me start out with um, a summary of the main result that I'll be describing in the talk. We construct n equals 1 supersymmetric ADS4 vacua in compactifications of type 2b string theory on oriental folds of Calabio hypersurfaces in toric varieties. And in these solutions, the vacuum energy is exponentially small, although it is negative. And in fact, in some cases, the magnitude of the vacuum energy is smaller than the observed value in our universe, 10 to the minus 123 in Planck units. At the same time, the internal spaces are not huge. They're of order, let's say, 1,000 in string units uh, in terms of volume. And another important qualitative point, in my opinion, is that the cost of the search is in no way proportional to 1 over the smallness of the vacuum energy. It's much less than that. Now, the mechanism underlying the construction is a racetrack that I'll describe in great detail. It's a racetrack of type 2a world sheet instantons. And what happens is that modest integers, specifically Gopukumar Bafa invariants and three-form flux quanta, end up being combined by the supersymmetric vacuum conditions in such a way that some of them get exponentiated. And they give a vacuum energy that takes a form like this. So here's an example. Uh, 2 and 252 show up in a geometry that I'll show you. Um, as Gokupumbar Vafa invariants, and 58 uh, shows up as the number of units of certain quantized three form fluxes. And in combination, they give this spectacularly small vacuum energy. Now, these models are in no way realistic. The vacuum energy is negative, first of all, uh, n equals one supersymmetry is preserved. And although the Kaluza Klein scale is quite high, so not problematically low at least, some of the moduli are ultra light. I see no reason that these models couldn't be uplifted to De Sitter vacua in which one could find vacuum energy plus 10 to the minus 123 and Planck to the fourth, namely the observed value. But in such models, the moduli scales and the supersymmetry breaking scales would be at the present day Hubble scale or smaller, and so in no way uh, realistic. So these constructions don't yet help with the real cosmological constant problem, which after all is to get a small cosmological constant after breaking supersymmetry at a significant scale. What they do is solve a sort of supersymmetric CC problem. Namely, they show us how an exponentially large supersymmetric universe can arise in a theory with a small fundamental length scale. I should stress that um, some of these questions wouldn't even arise in a theory with, exact, uh, with continuous parameters. You can just dial the size of the universe you'd like to make. But as we know, in string theory, the fundamental parameters are quantized. And then the question arises, what values do the quantized parameters take? And can they give rise to exponentially large universes, even supersymmetric ones? These constructions also change at least my own personal picture of how accessible such solutions are in the string landscape. And I'll comment on that a fair bit toward the end. OK, so a slightly more technical summary, uh, we find quantized fluxes for which the vacuum expectation value of the gukov fafa witten flux superpotential is exponentially small. And the string coupling is polynomially small. The non-perturbative superpotential arises from Euclidean D3 brains wrapping certain divisors, these are rigid prime toric divisors, with constant Fafians. And I'll unpack all of those terms later on. All the tadpoles are canceled, all the moduli are stabilized, as one would like. We end up explicitly including roll sheet instanton corrections to the killer potential. That'll form one of the main topics later on. And to do this work, we relied on a bunch of new tools for computing GV invariants, for constructing orientifolds, for uplifting the F theory, enumerating Euclidean brains, et cetera. And all of these things at large Hodge numbers, large H11 and in some cases, large H21. So that's a bit of a computational advance that powered the constructions. These are the people who did the work. My former students, Mehmet Demertis and Nanki Kim, now postdocs current postdoc Jakob Moritz, and current student Andres rias Tescom. And we have a bunch of works in progress uh, with the co-authors listed here. OK, so just to be clear, because all of this talk will be about vacua of KKLT type, um, let me state quite openly that um, we're seeking broader things. We'd really like to compute the string landscape 
or in some corner of the spring landscape uh, as much as we can. It turns out that the particular constructions I'll present today are one of the first things we found that, were, that um, we judged to be worth reporting. But what we really like to do is more broadly understand through enumeration what kinds of solutions are possible in quantum gravity, what kinds of four-dimensional quantum field theories coupled to GR are possible. And we'd like to construct ensembles of vacua where we can study the cosmological and particle physics phenomenology. Okay, so the plan, uh, first I'll explain how to get an exponentially small flux superpotential. We'll combine that with Kähler moduli stabilization to get vacua. And then I'll explain why these are controlled constructions. Okay, so I'm gonna begin with uh, setting the stage, describing the KKLT construction uh, to frame what we're gonna actually do. So let's consider a compactification of type 2b string theory on an oriental fold of a Calabia threefold. Throughout this talk, type 2b will be compactified on a space that I'll call x. x tilde will be its mirror. So let's compactify type 2b on x. And we're going to include, by assumption, quantized three-form flux, an n equals one supersymmetric, pure super yang mill sector on D7 brains. By pure, I mean no charged matter fields. We'll also include a warp deformed conifold region, i.e. klebanov strassler solution that contains one or more anti-D3 brains. And in a compactification that unites all of these ingredients, the claim of KKLT is that in a suitable parameter regime, these sources put together yield a metastable desitter vacuum, and the corrections to the approximations are controllably small. We won't be building desitter vacua today, we'll be building anti-desitter vacua. And for anti-desitter vacua, we can leave out the anti-brains. We may opt to leave out the conifold region where we could include it, and one ends up uh, with the same logic in a supersymmetric ADS4 vacuum. Now, a bit more about the content of this theory. The moduli are the axiodiliton, H21 complex structure moduli, H11 Kähler moduli. In the examples I'll show you later, you should think of the number of complex structure moduli as being between, it'll turn out to be between four and seven. The number of Kähler moduli will be between 51 and 214. So roughly you know, a handful of complex structure moduli and hundreds of Kähler moduli. All right, so let's choose some quantized three-form flexes and make the complex combination F3 minus tau H3, I'll call that G3. Then the resulting four-dimensional N equals one supersymmetric supergravity theory is described by a gukov waffle witten flux superpotential that comes from integrating the three-form flux against the holomorphic three-zero form over the Calabia threefold X. And for generic choices of the quantized data, the quantized fluxes, the solutions of the F-term equations for the axiodiliton and for the complex structure moduli are isolated. And so the, those moduli are fixed. They receive supersymmetric masses and one has isolated supersymmetric vacuum. Below the scale where those masses arise, the scale related to uh, alpha prime and one over the square root volume of the space, one finds an effective theory that only involves the Kähler moduli. Let's assume for the purpose of uh, writing stuff on this slide, although not later on, that there's just one Kähler modulus, then the Kähler potential looks like minus three log T plus D bar with T, the complexified volume of the basic four cycle. Uh, Liam, sorry, yes, can, you, uh, can you remind okay. me of something from the previous slide? Sorry, this is something Please. I should probably know. These mass squares um, in isolated solutions are of either side, are these generally saddle points or are they min minima, local minima? Uh, these are going to be minima here. Mm -hmm. um, and then we, are we, may find, we may find saddles in some other directions. Uh, okay, but so this is, um, I mean, this is something we discussed before, but this is, these being minimum means it's not the kind of naive say, um, random matrix theory picture of mostly getting saddle points in this landscape. This is an example yeah. where, where it's where it's the structure actually gives you something, um, I mean, in this context, better than that. Is that is that correct? It's correct, although it's for even a simpler, uh, okay. yes. And I would say the structural reason is, is maybe a simple one. Um, the solutions of those equations, if you neglect the Kähler moduli and the minus 3w squared, um, those are just no scale, but in the complex structure sector, supersymmetric solutions. And so the vacuum energy um, in that sector, neglecting the minus three W squared just goes to zero on these solutions and is strictly positive away from them. So they have to be minima. Um, 
So that structure is built in. And, and um, to your general point, um, we are going to be living expensively off indeed this fact that um, one is beginning with true supersymmetric minima rather than starting in some relatively random place high up in a potential and hoping for the best. Yeah, that, that's gonna be crucial. Is that addressing the question about structural patterns? Okay, oh, oh, um, please let me know if, if that's not clear. I should have said- I think you were muted if you were trying to oh, make a comment. Huh. Okay, um, which part did you stop hearing? Um, no, 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 I think he was saying I was muted. Everything's okay, good. Got it, okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, and thank you for asking. Um, please, please, everybody interrupt me. I, I thought with this audience, there was no need to say it, but maybe I'll say it. Please uh, shout out and, and let's have a conversation as we go. Okay, so um, below the scale where the complex structure module I get mass, the flex superpotential can be evaluated on the VEZ of the complex structure module. And you can just call it that number, W naught, uh, the angle brackets denote evaluating on those VEZs. So in this theory, now let's consider a stack of seven brains that support a pure super Yang Mills theory with gauge group SU and C. Actually, later it'll be SO8, but let's do SU and just for illustration now. Then uh, at low energies, that theory generates a gauge condensate superpotential. And when you compare the gauge condensate superpotential um, expression to the expression for the gauge coupling function in terms of the Keller moduli, you find that it can be written as e to the minus t up to a prefactor, as shown here. So the total superpotential is a constant flux term and then an exponential in t. The prefactor a, which we'll make a big deal about later, uh, is a Fafian that encodes dependence on the moduli from a one-loop determinant. Let's imagine it's a constant for the moment. Now, this supergravity theory, if you just write it down and think about it um, and not inquire too much about its string theory origin, does have a supersymmetric ADS4 minimum. You can plot it like this. So here I'm plotting real part T on the horizontal axis and the potential on the vertical axis. And um, that at that supersymmetric minimum, the real part of T, namely the size of the four cycle in question, is large only if W naught is exponentially large. Small, my mistake. Uh, if W naught is exponentially small, so if one over W naught is exponentially large, the minimum is at large volume. Okay, and it's crucial that this relationship is logarithmic in W naught. So to control the alpha prime expansion in a solution like this, one ought to seek solutions in which W naught is a small number. Now there's an old statistical argument that says that small W naught is not generic, um, but it should occur for some of the exponentially many choices of quantized flux. And if one could only find such choices, one would have in hand a solution in which the alpha prime expansion is well controlled. Now, with the I state of the can, can, can I make a small comment? What is, yep. if, if you weren't a string theorist and just made a field theory argument, um, in the old field theory days, you could have argued that when W equals zero, one can have a vacuum with unbroken R symmetry. Yeah. And so um, any theory that has R symmetry spontaneously broken at a low scale would have a, uh, what you know in the old days would be called a natural excuse to have exponentially small W. So one would have thought that if, if one was a smart enough model builder, one could make something with spontaneous R breaking that would give exponentially small W. But as far as I know, nobody ever actually implemented that and it would be complicated. Well, I haven't seen it implemented as such in as many words. Um, maybe, let me flag that and we can perhaps come back to that in about 30 minutes when I've shown uh, how this construction works, because it is the case that there are plenty of, of, of rhymes between the construction that we're gonna come up with and things that one could reasonably have done in the old, um, old sort of racetrack model building days, let's say late eighties or something like that in supersymmetric field theories and supergravity. Um, with the only distinction being that here, one is uh, getting those theories from fundamentally quantized inputs and checking that they're consistent quantum gravities. Um, but, but maybe when I formulated things that way at the end, um, we, we can see whether it reveals anything about our, our breaking. Good, other comments, questions? Okay, well, one should still ask, do there really exist consistent compactifications of string theory with First, quantized flux is giving a small classical superpotential, and two, suitable instanton effects, including D3 brains or the geno condensates, to stabilize the Keller moduli. And the answers are, uh, for the first question, yes, although we only showed this a couple of years ago, 
Uh, and on the second point, yes, as well. Um, there were pioneering works by Denif Douglas Floria Gracia Gatru in 2005, and also by Denif Douglas and Floria in 2004, that laid out a lot of these pieces. Um, and I think we've um, expanded on them to a significant degree now with some technology that I'll describe to you. And so this now suffices to construct totally explicit supersymmetric KKLT vacua. And we can just draw a line there. That's all I'm going to talk about in this talk. But just below the line, let me point out, it would be interesting to go on to Desitter. And if you remember from a few slides back, what one needs to get Desitter in this context is a conifold region and some antibrains or another source of supersymmetry breaking. And one can certainly find conifolds in exactly the same setting we've done it, conifolds along with exponentially small W naught. And it's just a matter of working it out to find examples uh, where all of these pieces are united. But we haven't done it yet, so I won't be saying any more about it today unless there are questions. Okay, so everything henceforth is super symmetric. So when I was asked to summarize this a couple of years ago, what I said was uh, this that strings, no evidence of obstructions or inconsistencies, but we were still awaiting ex complete explicit compactifications. I think we've addressed that for ADS and for Desitter, it's very much a work in progress still. Okay, so the main thing I'd like to explain is how we actually get small flux superpotentials. The statistical arguments suggest that such things should occur, but exponentially rarely. And preferentially when the moduli space dimension is large. We have tools that allow us to explore such spaces, but the brute force search is still really hard. And so it's gonna be better to find some sort of mechanism that we can apply. Uh, you know, the previous best was about 10 to the, W naught of about 10 to the minus two, but remember you have to take a log. So that doesn't give an enormous amount of control. So let's uh, try and do better. Okay, the mechanism I'll use is a racetrack. Here's an impression of what a racetrack should look like. And now let's start with uh, an impressionistic version of a racetrack in quantum field theory. So consider a four dimensional n equals one field theory, not supergravity, in which uh, the superpotential is a function of a single complex field Z. And let's suppose that actually the superpotential takes a form that looks like it comes from two instantons. Okay, it's two decaying exponentials with real prefactors, but positive exponents. And then as you go toward plus infinity along the real Z line, this superpotential goes to zero. But you can easily convince yourself by just treating this as a calculus problem in one real variable or along the axis or one complex variable generally that the superpotential can have a local minimum somewhere else. And so if you just calculate that, I mean, think about, for example, N1 and N2 being real but with opposite sign, then you can find a minimum at a place given by this expression. The thing to observe about this expression uh, is that if the exponents P1 and P2 are quite close to each other, and the prefactors N1 and N2 are slightly hierarchical, then the superpotential at the minimum is exponentially small. I said something at the start um, that the supersymmetric vacuum condition would put together a bunch of input integers in an exponential way. This is what's uh, being referred to. Okay, so one has some basic data. In fact, in the real constructions, n1 and n2 won't be real, they'll be rational. Um, in fact, they'll be integers, and p1 and p2 will be rational. Okay, but to make anything of this general idea, one really needs to show that in some bona fide solution of string theory, in fact, the superpotential takes such a form. We want the flux superpotential to look like it's made of two exponentials with exponents that are quite close and prefactors that are hierarchical. Liam, why do you need n2 much less than n1? It seems like you're raising it to a, what could be a high power. So it seems like a factor of two might be enough. Factor of two might be enough. It depends on how far you want to go. Um, you can certainly live off of the factors of, of, of two and five. Um, we ended up you know, if you want to get 10 to the minus 100, then you're, you're probably going to want, you know, a, a 10 on the inside and 100 on the outside or something like that. And you have to decide where is most painful to try to achieve this. Um, we don't need much less than strictly understood. No, no, a factor of a few is fine. Uh, parametrically, you need one or the other, but not both. Well, um, parametrically, you need at least a little bit of one and then plenty of the other. No, correct. Yeah. But like, you know, right. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. You know, two to a large number is totally fine. Absolutely. Um, yeah, you don't need big hierarchies. The 
one I referred to was two and it's 252, and then the exponents are quite close. Great, other questions about can, what's-, what's Can I just ask here? a clarification question? So previously yeah, when you wrote some exponentials in W, they were dependent on the T field. Uh, yeah, yeah. And now it's Z, so- um, Yeah, so, what, so what's going on? Yeah, so um, we're going to have, I have an expression where W is W naught plus A e to the minus two pi over NC T, like that. Yeah. And. Um, this is going to come later. This is dependent on the Kalo moduli, and that's uh, later in the talk. Right now, I'm just looking at the flux superpotential, and I've not explained to you why in the world the flux superpotential, which is a classical object, has exponentials in it. I'll explain it within about two slides. Okay, but, but it doesn't have power normal. laws for some non denormalization reasons, or? Repeat the question, please. Uh, I'm just asking, why are there no power laws in Z, for example, just polynomial? Oh, yeah, yeah, that's the trick. That's the trick. I'll show you. Uh, it's not born that way. We had to make it that way. Okay, thanks. Yeah, great question. Right, so to, to expand on that slightly, right now we're just talking about the classical flux superpotential, which is a function of the axial deleton and the complex structure moduli, given a choice of integral fluxes, and has nothing to do so far with Kähler moduli and Euclidean D3 brains. That's for slightly later in the talk. We'll have to do both, but let's do this one first. Okay, so we have to show these things. And um, to do this, well, let's just start doing some work. I'll, I'll show you how we do it. So the one slightly technical slide in terms of background, uh, in terms of rather setup and notation, let's consider um, the middle cohomology, H3 of X, Z. Um, and I'm gonna make a basis A alpha B, uh, alpha A, beta A, with A running from zero up to H21. That's a symplectic basis of H3. And I'm going to define the periods, the periods, the integrals of the three zero form omega over those basis cycles. Now you can express the periods in terms of the coordinates z a; those are homogeneous coordinates on moduli space, and in terms of the derivatives of a prepotential f with respect to the z a's. Sometimes I'll uh, get rid of z zero and just have h two one rather than h two one plus one coordinates. So then the prepotential in general is a polynomial function of the z's, as well as uh, sum of an infinite series of instanton terms, exponential in the z's. But before I show you that slightly gross form, let's just um, talk about what goes on in the computation here. So a key technical advance that lies behind this work is computing the prepotential here via mirror symmetry. And if you worked in mirror symmetry, you may be saying, wait a minute, isn't that what mirror symmetry does and has been doing since the early 90s? Yes, certainly, that's what it's for in, in one view. Um, the principles of what we've done are, have been totally clear since the early days, but what we had to contribute was actually doing it in threefolds with many moduli, and by many, I mean more than two. So we have to do it in threefolds with, in fact, hundreds of moduli, and typically one could do you know, two uh, on paper, with some codes, three or four, maybe. Um, and so just a few words about what the calculation is. I won't bore you with actually doing it. I'll just report results. But here's what goes on under the hood. The computation is purely geometric. Even though there are some exponentials, there's no actual instanton computation going on. And the essential idea is to compute what's called the fundamental period. The fundamental period is the integral of the 3, 0 form omega over a distinguished three cycle. It's actually a three torus associated with the phases of the toric coordinates. And um, you compute it directly. You just write it down, work it out, and then use that data to extract the whole vector of periods. And then the only final step is to express all that data in an integral basis by using the known integral structure of the mirror threefold. We, we okay, so that last step is the one I always thought would be hard. Um, solving yeah. PF equations seemed yeah. like something you could do, but, but the last yeah. step seemed hard. Was there a trick? There wasn't really. At LCF, it's not that hard, I would say. A large complex structure, it's not that hard. So I, I agree with you. That was my impression as well. And um, it's, it's one of these things, at least in my viewing of it, where it seems cloudy for a long time. And then all of a sudden, you're like, wait a minute, this wasn't actually that hard. The hard thing, um, the hard thing in scaling it up um, is, is really figuring out which charge vectors inside the Mori cone to look at. Um, and there, there, we actually had to do a little bit of work. So, um, but in principle doing this, 
Well, if you know the intersection numbers of the mirror, then you know that monodromy is around large complex structure. And so it's not really that hard to pick out the integral basis, I would say. Um, around a place other than large complex structure, it could be arbitrarily hard. I, I have very little to add. I mean, I can say a little bit about the conifold, but in general, I have no idea. Sorry, um, the monodromies yeah. are enough data to totally determine the basis. I think so. Yeah, I, th I think it's sufficient. We um, we were able to find the the appropriate coordinates um, and a symplectic basis without inputting any other data than the intersection numbers and uh, second and third. Well, thirds just chi, but second turn class. Um, okay, and, well, uh, I don't want to disturb your talk. We can talk about it later. Okay. Yeah. Great. Okay. Um, yes, I please. have another a very naive question. So. If I remember correctly, this F prepotential object lives in n equals two supersymmetry. Yeah. Whereas you want it to have n equals one. Very good. Yeah. Right. Uh, so, good. so I'll I'll um you, you might be asking two things. One is like, why is there any n equals two stuff happening? Or more dangerously, you might you might be thinking like um corrections from breaking n equals two to n equals one will kill you. If you're thinking the former, um, well. We're going to orient a fold and introduce flexes, and both of those things break n equals two to n equals one, but they do so in a way that's suppressed by factors of the string coupling. So as long as we find a solution at which the string coupling is weak, this will be self-consistent. So our strategy throughout is to work in n equals two as much as we possibly can, lock down everything, and then very weakly break n equals two to n equals one. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but, th but that's an excellent point. And I haven't oh, so I haven't shown you a super potential; I've shown you a pre-potential. So. Um, Maybe on the rest of this slide, I'll, it might be a little more clear because I'll show how to relate the n equals two to n equals one data. Okay. Um, and specifically, so yeah, maybe, maybe let me show you that in a, in a um, about thirty seconds. So, um, okay, I described a procedure for doing this. We did it. When you do it, what do you get? The polynomial part is a sum of a cubic, quadratic, linear, and constant where the prefactor things there are stuff that depend on the data of the mirror. So the intersection numbers of the mirror and turn classes of the mirror. So just integral stuff that you know. The instant dots are more complicated, but in principle, well knowable. Uh, they involve a sum over, so here M of X tilde is the Mori cone of the mirror. So it's the cone of all holomorphic curve classes in the mirror. So you sum over all holomorphic curve classes that are integral. Um, and for each one, you get a trilogarithm of an exponential in the moduli with a prefactor. And the prefactor n sub q tilde is the genus zero GV invariant of x tilde, and that's some integer. That's counting BPS states. Okay, so um, how about a superpotential? Well, remember that superpotential is the integral. W flux is equal to the integral. G wedge omega over x. So if I know the integrals of omega and G over x separately, I can just pair them together. And that's what's done in this formula. Um, the periods are the integrals of omega over x, and f vector and h vector are the integrals of the three form flexes over x. And you just pair those things together with, it turns out not with the identity, but with the symplectic matrix sigma written on the right. Okay, and here's where the n equals one n equals two to n equals one breaking is happening because the flexes aren't zero. Instead of having an n equals two object, a prepotential, you have an n equals one object, a superpotential. Now, here's the point. Um, because the prepotential has a polynomial and an instanton part, also you can write the flex superpotential as having a polynomial or perturbative and an instantonic part. Basically by taking the part from f poly and calling it perturbative, the part from f inst and calling it Instantonic. This can be confusing if you don't remember that um, everything is classical here in type 2b. And I'm only calling it instantonic because it would be an instanton if you were thinking about type 2a on the mirror x tilde. Okay, you can think of f inst written there as type 2a roll sheet instantons, but it's still classical in 2b. Okay, any questions about that decomposition? OK, so we just have one basic idea here. We're going to try to find f vector and h vector um, such that the perturbative part of the flux superpotential is identically 0 along one direction in moduli space. OK, this now answers the question, what happened to the, why isn't there any polynomial stuff? We're going to find quantized fluxes that aren't 0 
but such that the perturbative contribution exactly cancels. Not to high approximation, but exactly cancels. And since we're picking integers and popping them into an integer expression, that can be done exactly without quantum corrections. And we call this a perturbatively flat vacuum. The statement that's perturbatively flat is exact, but then it's not exactly flat because there is an instantonic part left over in the flux superpotential. So the next part of the idea is to ensure by careful choice, in other words, by looking until we find one, that the instantonic part of the flux superpotential is a racetrack. Okay, so we buy two things. First, we choose fluxes to buy a perfectly flat direction at the perturbative level. All that's left is instantons. Second, we buy by looking until we find one that what remains is a racetrack of instantons, and that leads to stabilization. Okay, so that's the whole idea. Let's see that laid out in an example. Um, we studied a geometry which is a hypersurface in a torque variety with H21 equals 5, H11 equals 113. Let me find some quantized fluxes. Here they are in some basis, such that along a particular direction in the joint complex structure moduli comma axio deleton moduli space, a direction defined by this vector, the perturbative part of the flux superpotential exactly vanishes. So note that this vacuum or this condition, perturbatively flat vacuum condition, links the complex structure moduli and the axio deleton. So we're going to express everything in terms of the axio deleton tau henceforth. All right, Liam, I just have to ask for yeah, clarification yeah. to make sure that I'm still uh, you know, on the same page. So um, you stress that this is using mirror symmetry, so it's it's actually fully classical on the complex structure side. Yeah. Um, uh, that makes all, that all makes sense, um, but it's based on some world sheet and ton expansion in the mirror. Um, just, so just as a sanity check, this is not yet doing any any Euclidean D3 instantons. Yes, absolutely right. So all of this is just sitting in here, just in W0. Right, right, right. Just, just, just checking. Thanks. Yeah, yeah. So in fact, perhaps I should even I should even write that. Let, let me write a full expression um, that will be that will be perhaps less confusing. The full W is going to be it's going to be a sum over some world sheet instantons e to the two pi i tau with some prefactors and a sub q tilde. That's the flux part. This is W flux. Ordinarily, in all other contexts, one finds that W flux involves perturbative things, but this doesn't. Uh, I'll, put, I'll put some factors P sum over I, QI, PI. And there's only going to be two terms that matter. It's a two term racetrack. I equals one to two plus a sum A is equal to one to at least H11 of AI e to the minus two pi. Yeah, now, this is a schematic expression, but this is to make clear that we're going to have a whole sum of ED3s over here from effects that really are quantum in type 2b. And then here, these are just classical effects in 2b, but they're quantum in 2a. But anyway, yeah. it's exponentials everywhere you look, no classical terms. Yeah, I understand. I just wanted to check. Thank you very much. Yeah, great. Thank you for asking. Okay, good. So, all we've got left since we've found this choice of fluxes for which there's an exactly flat direction at the perturbative level, all that remain are the world sheet instantons, and the leading ones happen to have GV invariance minus two and 252, one can check. And that means the flux superpotential as a function of this one flat direction, so we might as well use tau, since z and tau are proportional, um, is what you see here. And I call your attention to the stuff in red. The exponents are 7 29ths and 7 28ths. So quite close. And the next one in black, 104, et cetera, is a much bigger exponent, so never mind. So that, and that's the first subleading thing. So really to extreme accuracy, only the red stuff matters. And um, you can easily minimize this function. And what you find is the modular is stabilized at W naught, uh, approximately two over 252 to the 29th, which is 10 to the minus 62, and G string about log of that, so about, 0.01. Sorry, could you remind me what was setting the exponents? Was it this p vector? Yeah, thank you. Um, so I didn't, um, it is, that is what's setting it. Um, if you look here um, in, this ex in this expression, see in the trilog, it's two pi i q tilde dot z. And q tilde is some homology class, the data of a homology class. So you pick some curve class and um, along the flat direction, in moduli space, 
but we know how to evaluate what z is. So z is set by um, this vector p times tau. So it is, as you say, the, the choice of flexes that determines a rational vector p also tells you what does z look like along the flat direction, and so then what do the exponents look like? I see. Uh, and, and the way I should be thinking about this is that as long as you've got sufficiently many H11 classes and you're able to find some perturbatively flat direction, probably two of those classes are going to be pretty close in angle, uh, like this p tilde dot z is going to be pretty small, or, or are going to get to be pretty close to each other. So, so it's not a completely, um, it's not guaranteed that such a vacuum exists in every threefold, um, mm -hmm. but is not that rare. And when you find one, it works out along, along roughly the lines that you're saying, namely that, um, so, so what do you really do? You, you pick some fluxes that fulfill the perturbatively flat condition when, when is such a solution exists, and you look out along the flat direction. And it's not always true that what you have are two terms that are roughly competitive and then everything else falls off steeply. We select on cases that have that desirable property. Okay, cool, thank you. Okay, so these, I, these can you uh, very nice question. Sorry, uh, on the previous slide, um, the where was the data about the fluxes appearing in this f f poly of z? Yeah, f f itself doesn't know. So f poly is just waiting to receive the fluxes. F poly is an n equals two object, and the data of the fluxes is in f three minus tau h three, which after integrating them over cycles, I expressed as f little f vector and little h vector toward the bottom of the screen. And those things dotted with the periods um, tell you about the structure of w. And so what we needed to do is ensure that those things dot with the periods in such a way that there is a perturbatively flat direction. Um, have, have I answered the question? I can, I can say more. Uh, I'm sure you have. I'm just trying to process it. Um. The thing he's calling is, pi is like derivatives of script f. Sorry, could you say it again, Shaman? The thing he's calling pi that's dotted into little f and little h is like derivatives of script f. OK. And so script f enters through pi. And fundamentally, though, the thing that we're computing here is like some pre-potential that uh, allows us to compute a potential that is fundamentally like integrals of f squared for fluxes. Yes. And, so, so what, okay. right. So what we first do is we compute um, the, this geometric thing that I was saying. We compute. You're computing the period integrals. You're just computing the integral of omega over three cycles. Yeah. That you can then repackage into the expression at the top of the screen. Pi vector is some derivative of the prepotential with respect to the coordinates. And so then the data of knowing the periods is the same as the data of knowing the prepotential. Now, if you know the prepotential, um, then you can and you've specified some three form flux. You can dot those two things together as shown at the bottom. And that is the super potential that reconstructs, as you say, um, the f wedge star f and h wedge star h scalar potential contributions. OK. And the, OK, OK, yes. Thank you. Is, is that good? Is that answered it? Yes, thanks. OK, great. So right. So just expanding slightly more. So if you look at this f poly here, what is required to do is one has to stare at the form of f poly, which is given by the topological data of the mirror, and ask, hmm, what sort of you know, f and h do I need to put in here such that I'll get a perturbatively flat vacuum? So that's the exercise that we undertook. Um, and then you see what's left over. OK, great. So other questions before I go past this example? Um, sorry, just while, while I'm here, could, could I ask which stage of the computation was the tricky bit, for example? Like right here, you said that you need to you know, filter over a bunch of kalabi yaws to find this condition that you've got two exponents that are dominant and pretty close yeah. to each other. It, like, is this you know, the main bottleneck or are there more bottlenecks that are going to happen later? Just where, where are the big guys? Yeah, great. Okay, I'll tell you, um, if you don't mind, let me try and answer that over the next 10 minutes, because that's what the next part of the talk is actually about. It's like, oh, perfect. Are hard. <laughs> All right, thank um, you. Yeah, oh, one, one preview, though, is there are plenty of parts of the computation that were hard, like we had to learn how to do something or whatever. Strangely enough, there isn't one statistical bottleneck. There are plenty of computational bottlenecks, but there's not one place where we'd say, oh, you know, we have to pay exponentially more in die rolls to get past this threshold than another. They're all roughly in the same ballpark. It's just different kinds of work were required to get over each threshold. Yeah, good, good question. I'll, I'll try and okay. answer that. Interesting. Thank you. Oh, sorry, Liam? Yeah, please. 
Um, I think it's in the spirit of what you were just talking about. Um, you chose to zero out the perturbative part and you saw, you showed explicitly that you could do that. Um, and then you just made a remark about throwing dice and whether, what, how, how um, often that would happen in some sense. I yeah. guess you know one interesting thing about KKLT is it puts this W not in in competition. I mean, it plays it off of some non perturbative stuff that you're going to get. To, I mean, truly non perturbative stuff that you're going to get to. Um, and um, but to the extent that W not itself is naturally exponentially small, that's um, that that would not even be um, particularly tuned. I mean, existence is one thing. You could then ask, you know, okay, is it is it is it difficult to tune a perturbative against a non-perturbative or, or, or is it not? Um, and your results are going toward certainly existence and then also something about what you were just saying about the statistics of it. So I'm asking, um, how, do you have a, a way to, to phrase it that answers that question, if you know what I'm asking? I do, yeah, yeah. Um, here's the answer and I'll, I'll come back to it also at the end. Um, mm -hmm. I, I, Behind what you're saying is, is an observation that, you know, Deniff and Douglas, for example, gave predictions for the distribution of W naught. And um, this example here has H21 equals five. Their predictions were roughly exponential in B3. B3 is not big here. And so W naught's like this W naught here, 10 to the minus 62, should not exist according to their uh, calculation. But the point is their calculation was in the continuous flux approximation. In the continuous flux approximation, um, the fact that we've imposed one exact integer equation means that uh, it's a set of measure zero. So our solutions are of measure zero in the continuous flux approximation. They would never be found by sampling from the Deniff Douglas distribution. And so this is like a disallowably small W naught for this value of H21. And yet it exists. Because uh, when you haven't gone to a continuous flux approximation, um, nothing's really measure zero, right? It, it's a finite set, and this is a finite subset of that finite set. That doesn't mean these things are ridiculously common, but it means that they're not nearly as uncommon as you would get from the continuous flux approximation. And, 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 and in your studies, do you have some kind of statistics on this already or, or not? Or is that just asking too much of this? Um, not like formal ones, but what's clear morally is that it's uniformly distributed on a long scale. Just one, one comment, Liam, that might be useful for you is another example of this is supersymmetric flux vacua in the tree approximation, which just shouldn't exist by count. Yeah. But they certainly exist, and and it's a little odd that they exist. Um, so that's an even easier example, I think. Well, it, it, you're right, and in fact, when we've been talking a bit with Richard about you know whether these things are related, right? It, I don't know that they are, but it would be interesting if, in fact, they are related facts. Um, okay, great. So now let's go on to um, how do you actually manufacture these things? So I showed you one example, but you know several of you have asked in, in various ways you know, sort of what, where, where does it come from or how common is it, et cetera. So how do you actually manufacture these things? So here's, here's the process. You start with an oriental fold of a clavial, compute the prepotential via mirror symmetry. As I said, find some fluxes that align with the GV invariance in just the right way to give a racetrack along the flat direction without violating the tadpole. And the problem is that last step is a search in a lattice of dimension 2H21. So it's a 10-dimensional lattice in the case I just showed you. And we can do that up to maybe H21 to five, six, seven on a laptop or seven to 10 on a cluster. We didn't get deadly serious about it. Maybe it could go a little higher, but uh, it's not a, not a super fast thing. And so here's where we're gonna have to uh, bring in some machinery. The setting in which we did all this work is hypersurfaces. So we're gonna work with mirror pairs of Calabia threefold hypersurfaces, X and X tilde in parent toric varieties, V and V tilde, associated with triangulations of four-dimensional polytopes, delta circum delta, and um, there's a lot of these things. There's at least four, well, there's 473 million, 800,776 such 40 polytopes. Uh, and we proved that there's at most 10 to the 428 uh, Calabia threefolds resulting therein, but that's still plenty. So in this setting, what do you need to do? Um, this is just a laundry list of like all the stuff one would wanna be able to compute. Um, I won't go through them in any detail at all. But basically, you start with some polytope, and you need to extract a lot of topological data through computational geometry methods. And um, we've written some code released as a package CY tools that allows you to do that. In green is the stuff that's already in the public version, and in blue is the stuff that we'll release eventually that's in our private version now. And we can now easily handle this pretty much anywhere in the Kreutzer-Skarka list. 
uh, as I'll now show you. We have another quick question. Um, yeah. Going from the the number of things in the in in the list of torque varieties to the ten to the four hundred twenty eight is a large factor. Is that mostly flops? Uh, yes, uh, yes. In fact, the number of distinct triangulations of the biggest polytope. So the biggest polytope in terms of H one one is four ninety one. H one one equals four ninety one. That yeah. thing has up to ten to the 900, 928, Exactly ten to the five hundred more triangulations. But about ten to the five hundred factor of those are potentially redundant. So you just get down to this many distinct things. Uh, so essentially um, all of them are in, are accessible in one model. Um, yeah, the 10 to the 428 is dominated by one geometry. Right. Yeah, it's just one oh. geometry. And the polytope is the simplex. So okay. it's, it's just one absurd model. Yeah. That's not where we find all the models, but one that's where all the degeneracy comes from. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Yeah. I should stress this is a bound. I'm not saying there are this many. It could be that there's many of those that are uh, equivalent. And that's hard work to figure out. OK, so um, what's the deal with these with computing these various things? Um, here is the famous plot of the Hodge numbers of Calabia threefolds coming from the kreutzer scarka list, H11 on the x-axis, H21 on the y-axis. And the complexity of analyzing x grows exponentially as you go to the right, and of analyzing the mirror grows exponentially as you go up. They really mean exponentially. So if you took off-the-shelf software, um, you can colonize the stuff super close to the axes, where one of these Hodge numbers is like two, three, four, maybe five. And so let me stress, you could not have done the computations that I'm going to be talking about by just putting all of this stuff on a ridiculously big computer, even you know, a, a modern ridiculously big computer, there's exponential costs. What one really needed was uh, a set of new algorithms that take advantage of more structure and run in polynomial time rather than exponential time. So in the green, we, I show where we can search for flux vac. Remember I said, you can't search in too high dimensional lattice, at least we can't yet. Um, so that's where the lattice dimension is low. And in the purple band off on the left, that's where if you take a package like Instanton due to Clem, uh, you can compute the GV invariance of the mirror, uh, sorry, of X itself. The trouble is those things don't really intersect in a region where there's any dots. So that means the capabilities that are needed don't coincide with any actual geometries. So we expanded the capabilities. So now we can give you the GV invariance pretty much everywhere. And now that does overlap with the green band where we can also find flux vacua. And the sweet spot is where those things coincide and the H11 Hodge number is not absurdly big. But sometimes it's sort of big. So where the search for flux vacuum is feasible, which is down in that green band, um, H11 is typically large, or 100 or something. And so we actually had to do everything at large H11, the oriental folding, finding rigid divisors, uplift to F-theory, computing GV invariance. And every one of these things in its own little way, um, so it is in its own big way, has an exponential cost computationally. Um, and so we had to work on each of these strands separately. OK, but I won't bore you with any more of the computational side of things. Um, let's talk briefly about the Kähler moduli. So after choosing fluxes, we have an exponentially small flux superpotential, but the Kähler moduli aren't stabilized. What we'd really like to do is establish that the Kähler moduli are stabilized by a series of non-perturbative terms coming from Euclidean brains. So what I've written here is a sum over divisors, i.e. holomorphic hypersurfaces in X, um, exponential in the complexified volume of the divisor, that's TD. CD is a dual Coxeter number. It's one for a Euclidean D3 brainer. It'll be six for a stack of seven brains supporting an SO8 gauge group. So you should think of CD as either one or six. And the prefactor AD is a Fafian that depends on the complex structure moduli of the biloton. Now, we don't just want to establish that the superpotential has some ED3 terms. We want to establish that it has enough to stabilize all the killer moduli. And that means there better be at least H11 terms for H11 killer moduli with the Fafians not being actually identically zero. That's a minimal requirement. We're going to demand more. We're going to require, actually, that at least H1 of the Fafians are numbers, not zero numbers, without moduli dependence. That will simplify a lot of our life. Uh, could you explain this uh, super potential? I think at the beginning you said that you have some D7 brains. Or... Yeah, yeah, right. So there are two different things that can give rise to a term like the second exponential term. So uh, one thing is um, you could have D7 brains supporting, an, let's say, an SUNC n equals one super symmetric to be Yang Mills theory with no matter. That theory confines in the IR and generates 
uh, gauge you know condensate superpotential W lambda lambda is e to the minus eight pi squared over g squared plus i theta times one over the dual constant number of the gauge group. Hope that's legible. This is a one over c over here. Okay, and that is equal to the exponential of uh, two pi, the cor corresponding Kilo modulus t over the dual Cox per number with the minus sign. Okay, that's one thing. Sorry, and one another thing. Yes, please. Uh, uh, C. The C is the the dual Cox per number, which is n for S U N and uh, is six for SO8, for example. And this, the coupling is dimensionful. That's why we have this dependence on the T? Or? Uh, T is the dimensionless volume measured in stream units in 10D Einstein frame. Okay. Uh, sorry, which, uh, is the, the confusing thing is, is T or C? Uh, T. T, yeah, so, so T, what is T? T is... Um, For a divisor d, t sub d is defined to equal the integral over d of square root g plus i c4, with c4 the Ramon Ramon 4 form, uh, in string units. So that's just a dimensionless number whose real part measures the volume in string units and whose imaginary part is an axiom. So sorry, Liam, this, yeah. you, are, you are now talking about truly non perturbative effects. So, in, um, so there really is a one over g string in there somewhere. Right. Oh, yeah, yeah. I'm expressing this in Einstein frame, but in string frame, it's one over G string for sure. Well, well in, that the, was that the confusing thing about whether there, why is there no G string there? No, I mean, you could, you could write everything canonically in, four, in the four dimensional effective theory. In, in these the effects, are, effective these theory, effects are non perturbative in G string. That's right, what the, 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 the T modules find the right way includes the factor of G that you want, Eva. Yeah, I, I know. I'm just saying that to help clarify because it's not just a volume, it's a it's, oh, okay. it's, it's non perturbative in the, in the string couple. You can write it as e to the minus vol sub s over g string with vol sub s the volume measured in string frame. Okay. Well, okay. Now you're talking about the higher dimensional string frame, right? So, oh, for sure, yeah. Yeah, so, so yeah. <laughs> Well, I was just trying to help, but I think that this is this is a some sort of, you know, gauge you know, condensate effect, right? Um, in the yeah, 40, so the effective, in the 40 thing, effective theory, and yeah. that is that is a standard non perturbative effect in the 40 Yang Mills. <laughs> and, and because the 40 Yang Mills gauge coupling squared uh, is set by the string coupling to 8 pi squared over g squared is 4 pi over g string to the one. Yeah. This is the e to the minus one over g string effect. Yeah. All, yeah. All, all I'm saying is in 40, 40 Einstein frame, you would see the, the coupling explicitly there. Yeah. Um, yeah. Okay. Sorry. Just trying to help. Yeah. Um, now, let's see. So, possibly, uh, I mean, a potential confusion also is why am I talking about both Euclidean D3 brains and gauging of condensates? And why do I use like roughly the same words and equations to describe them? Well, in terms of their contribution to the four-dimensional theory, they differ only in that uh, C equals one for Euclidean D3 brains, so D3 brain instantons, and C is equal to NC for SU and C a genome condensation, and uh, C is equal equal six for SO8 a genome condensation. And the only things that will arise in our models are Euclidean D3 brains and SO8 stacks of seven brains, namely 4D7 brains, 107 stuck on top, giving the gauge algebra SO8. And those things give the same contribution to the superpotential, except that in one case, the denominator is a one, in one case, it's a six. Uh, is, is that helping? Are there more details, I should say, or, or, or something else? Well, it, it, yes, it's helping. Thank you. OK, so now. Um, how does one check whether these things actually arise? This is the place where, now coming back to a previous question, which was like, what were the, what were the hard parts? Conceptually, perhaps the hardest part was figuring out when we can be sure that there are contributions. Um, at least this was a slightly murky area. So we want to, to find a collection of contributions that we can ensure are not zero. How do we check that? So if you consider some divisor D, 
in X. And it's uplift D hat to F theory. So that's to a real six manifold inside a fourfold, Calabia fourfold, an eight real dimensional Calabia fourfold. Um, we can first use an old result of Witten, which says that if D hat is smooth and rigid, I'll define rigid in a moment, then it contributes to W, namely the Fafin is not identically zero. That's a fermion zero mode counting. It just says, under these conditions, the number of fermion zero modes on the world volume is exactly two, which is just what you need to get a term in W. Now, what's rigid mean? Rigid means that, the, that certain chief cohomology groups have the dimensions shown here, one, zero, zero, zero. But physically, it just means that the divisor only sits there and doesn't have any transverse deformations. That corresponds in the gauge theory picture to not having any charged matter fields. OK, so that tells us the Fafians aren't 0. But in general, there's still a section of some bundle over the fourfold moduli space. So the prefactor AD is like some function of Z and tau, which in general, one doesn't know how to compute. Uh, and it's not just that we're incompetent here. Uh, it's just generally not known how to compute these things, uh, except in toroidal orientifolds. But OK. One useful simplification is if the divisor happens to have what's called a trivial intermediate Jacobian, then the Fafian is a constant. It's a pure number. This is due to another old result of Witten, also from 96. And the intermediate Jacobian is this coset. So you take the divisor, compute H3 of dr mod H3 of dz, and that's something you can look at. And um, what Witten showed is that the Fafian depends on the moduli through the intermediate Jacobian's complex structure moduli dependence. But if H21 of the divisor is 0, then the intermediate Jacobian is just trivial. And so there's no complex structure modular dependence at all. And the Fafian is a number. We'll call it a Fafian number. And that can be computed. In fact, I think Alexander of Sten, uh, Sen and Stefanski are, in a, in a way, in the process of computing it in examples. They've already done it for n equals 2 models. They're getting close in n equals 1 models. Um, so. What we're going to do is search for smooth, rigid prime toric divisors with trivial intermediate Jacobian. So just a long list of, of requirements. Um, so just, just a couple more words about the Kähler moduli dependence, and then we'll, we'll leave this behind us. Um, to do this, to ensure this condition, what we need to check uh, is that H21 of d hat is 0. But we need to do this in cases where, as you remember, uh, all the Hodge numbers are big. In particular, H11 is big. All these conditions are well-defined. You can try and figure them out by, you know, do some sequence chasing and then try and code it up. But if you just try and code it up directly, you'll pay exponential cost. And what you need to do is use some sort of additional structure. So what uh, Mankey Kim did is use stratification and break the toric variety up into a lot of pieces and reassemble it. And then you can get a combinatorial formula. And then, then you can just trivially implement the computation in, in, in a simple Mathematica notebook and, and compute these numbers in a flash. So that's what we did. So thus equipped, we found tons of models. Uh, Liam, can I ask two stupid questions? Please, please. Um, the first one is, um, in plain English, your condition for intermediate Jacobian is just there shouldn't be torsion in H3. Is that it? Um, no, I'm actually going to make, uh, I'm going to make H3 of d hat r actually equal to 0 itself. Oh, I see. Well, that's OK. Well, that certainly is stronger. Yeah. Yeah, um, no, H21, because H03 is just zero. And so H21 yeah. is zero, just, there's no middle cohomology at all. Fine. OK. And then um, if I wanted to be skeptical, uh, which is always good to be, I could ask about multi covers and what you know about the combinatorics and growth of coefficients of multi covers. Do you have anything to say about that? I mean, presumably you're in a large enough regime of T that you'd guess there's exponential damping, but OK, then you could complain, well, how do you know the pre factor doesn't grow exponentially? And, I don't think it's realistic, yeah. but I, I'm yeah. wondering. Um, we have some speculations about how the multi covers look. Um, those speculations do not suggest any kind of rapid growth. The place where we understand the multi covers really well is with curves, as I'll show you a little bit later, or maybe in a discussion afterward or something. Um, we don't have any quantitative estimates here. Now, it is, it is entirely possible, um, I, I guess, that even in a regime, so we'll be in a regime where like 2 pi t is, is like 50 or something like that. Um, yeah, it, it's logically possible, I suppose, that that's not within the radius of convergence of the expansion. Um, I want to stress that this would not be something that's um, 
sort of a unique vulnerability of this construction or of a KKLT model or anything else. We just mean that the world, the, the, the Euclidean brain expansion is wildly different from what one would naively think from Ladin instanton expansion. Uh, that's that's possible. We can't exclude it until we compute those multi-covers. We'll, we'll try and do it. Um, one reassuring thing, though, is that um, as long as the whole thing converges, the numerical values of these Fafians don't matter much. They can range between, we checked 10 to the minus 4 and 10 to the 4, and it doesn't change our vacuum structure at all. So um, that's because they appear compared to an exponentially small W0. Yeah, it's Thank a good you. point. I mean, I would like to know the multi-covers, honestly. You had two questions. Oh, you added through your previous one. It was about uh, intermediate Jacobian, right? Great. Other questions. So I'm going to leave this behind, actually, and we're going to move on to vacuum structure. Um, and then should I try and finish in like 10 minutes or something like that? And then we'll discuss the rest afterward? Or what, what's, what's best? Yeah, that sounds good. Yeah. OK. OK. So um, we've proved now that the superpotential takes the KKLT form. Um, and the killer potential is minus 2 log of well, the threefold volume in, in some way, depending on the killer moduli. I'll make that more clear in a moment. What we want to do is find a supersymmetric vacuum. And you can easily, for this effective theory, convince yourself that at that supersymmetric vacuum, the real parts of the various killer moduli are all proportional to each other. And the constants of proportionality are just the dual Coxeter numbers, so one or six. So roughly, you should think that all the killer moduli are equal. That's a very well-defined point inside the Keller cone, but where in the Keller cone is it really? So here's a picture of the Keller cone in the threefold with H11 equals 491. Each little polygon is the Keller cone of a parent toric variety. And all of these things are unified to form an extended Keller cone. Go through from one polygon to an adjacent polygon, you're going through a flux of a, of a parent toric variety. And what one faces is something like a starting point on the left, and then the supersymmetric vacuum might be at the place on the right. And you certainly can't just throw darts to find it, but we found a way to take a bearing and just move through the bulk to find it. Sorry, Liam, could you say just yeah. one more time, what, uh, where are we going with this, this picture just, just briefly? I, I missed the part about the scalar cone. Yeah, Wh why am I showing this picture? Yeah, yeah. what is going on? Yeah. Right, what is going on is the following. We've computed the effective theory. The effective theory is characterized by this W and this K, as shown on screen. What we want to do is find a supersymmetric vacuum. Now, what the supersymmetric vacuum looked like in the one modulus case was this cartoon that I drew. There was a, there was real T was one dimensional, and there was a minimum at some finite value of real T. Okay. Yeah. Now, this is the analog of that. It's just that I've added H11 minus one other directions. Uh -huh. If you take okay. i to run only over one value, then this is actually the equation I showed you at the beginning for how is real t related to log w0. But mm -hmm. now we need to solve it fulfilling the supersymmetric conditions for all the moduli at once, not just for one. And what the picture shows is that the space in which that search needs to be carried out is a complicated space. But in fact, you can ignore, um, you can ignore that picture if you like and just... Um, I... Sorry, go ahead. I guess my question is just, what is the Kähler cone? What does the cone mean? Oh, yeah. OK. Yeah, let me explain that. So um, the, the Kähler form is a two-form. And um, not every closed two-form leads to a Kähler metric in which the cycle volumes are non-negative. So the Kähler cone is the space in um, R to the H11 the space of real two forms in R to the H11 that are closed, where um, if you take one of those things and define it to be the killer form, the resulting metric is a good metric, and everything that needs to be non-negative in volume is non-negative in volume. The trouble is, who needs to be non-negative in volume? It depends sort of on your perspective. And these different polygons show, as you go from one to another, you're changing which cycles you're making to be positive or negative in volume. Those are flops. And so this shows the, so the whole space of sort of possible cycle sizes, and the boundaries are the places where the good description ends forever. OK, thank you. That's helpful. OK, but actually, um, this search was just to, to sort of give a picture of, of what happens. We can leave it behind and just trust, OK, we found a vacuum for each geometry. And let's see whether it makes any sense. So first of all, the super potential we completely control. I claim we've really proved it, because um, We've checked that our vacuum persists for a wide range of numerical values of the Fafian numbers. We've proved that Euclidean brains on other divisors are negligible. Um, 
modulo, again, multi-covers that dominate over exp parametric exponentials. So that's a possibility, but not one I think is likely. And we proved that, for example, D instantons, Euclidean D minus one brains are also negligible because the string coupling is so weak. But how about the killer potential? This is where the real trouble comes in. Um, the Einstein frame volumes are large because W not super small. But the string frame for cycle volumes are about of order unity. And when cycle volumes are over unity, at first sight, you might think that we're in really big trouble as far as the alpha prime expansion goes. But we're not in that much trouble because the string coupling is very weak, like 10 to the minus two, for example. And so the leading corrections are going to come in at string tree level, but to all orders in alpha prime. Here again, we're going to use n equals one structure. So at the string tree level, in the n equals one solution, we actually know exactly what the metric uh, in the Kähler moduli space looks like. It looks like the vector multiple at moduli space of 2a on that same space. It's sort of like, this is sort of like the CMAP, but it's the include the vectors inside the hypers version of the CMAP. And you can just write it down. Um, here's what the Kähler potential looks like at string tree level. Then this is plus order G string, but G string is small, so we're not going to have uh, a lot of pain from those corrections. So what is this expression that you're looking at? There's some cubic in uh, T. So here, Ts are two cycle volumes uh, rather than four cycle volumes. Little T is a two cycle volume. Here's a volume that's cubic in T, um, as well as a sum of exponentials. In the exponentials, Q is a curve class, T is a vector of killer parameters, and B is a half integral two form, uh, Galbraith mode two form. And the NQs are GV invariants. But now that the GV invariants not of X tilde the mirror, but of X, that's the space with a big dimensional Kähler moduli space. So now these are GV invariants in some 113 dimensional space rather than in a, in a five dimensional space. Okay, so um, let, me, um, let me try and finish up the statements about convergence and then, then we can, no, actually I'll, I'll I will skip over. We can come back to this afterward, or someone can ask me someday if you want. Um, we had to, the, the only place where we had to do a truly brutal calculation, um, where we had to go on a cluster and couldn't do everything on a laptop, is checking convergence of this expansion. So we had to look in a 214 dimensional cone and find hundreds of thousands of integral sites, compute the G variance at all of them. And we found GV invariants that look like this. These are things that I claim um, cannot be computed by other means. Uh, if you know a lot about mirror symmetry, you, you, you might know that GV invariants are really easily computed in non-compact models. But in compact models, uh, I don't know of any general capability when the number of moduli is bigger than, say, three or four. And here we've done it for uh, hundreds of moduli, up to degree like 100, as shown there. And all of this is just to show that the expansion, it, the world sheet instanton expansion does converge. These descending lines are the are plots of the nth contribution in the expansion, that's the symbol written up at the top, Cn, versus n, the degree. So this is just showing that as you go further and further out in the world sheet instanton expansion, the corrections drop exponentially, which means that everything's under good control. Sorry, um, yes, that's, yeah. dumb, that's probably yeah. a dumb question, but um, you can't use a mirror to help with this, a mirror description of this world sheet instanton sum? Um, Right, so we've, we've here's, here's what we've done. Um, what, what we're looking at here is now um, the killer moduli space of type 2b, so a big dimensional killer moduli space of type 2b, so that's a hyper. And what we've done is say, ah, in the, in, at string tree level, there's actually a vector hiding in there. It's type 2a on that same manifold. That's what's written down here. But how do I compute type 2a on that manifold? Actually, by putting type 2b on the mirror x tilde and doing the computation over there. So that's where I got these numbers from. But you can't use it to, um, or at least we were not strong enough to write down an exact expression. Rather, we could only write the GV expansion. Uh, OK, although the world genus on expansion is the, is the 2a thing. Um, Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. OK. okay. So, so what we're doing is we're using the 2a thing. It's just that. What you what you might be tempted to do is write down. Let, let me let me give an example. Um, yeah, okay. At the bottom, I'm showing what happens for the quintic. So for the quintic, you can estimate. You know, how big do the Kähler module have to? Does the Kähler modulus have to be for everything to converge nicely? Okay, and you might say, well, I know how big the first GV invariant is. It's the famous 2875. So the 
estimate, t min one is one over two pi log of 2875, 1.27. What Candelas and company did long ago was to do an exact calculation, not just expanding in a series and show the actual radius of convergence is 1.2. Okay, now two things. That shows that, at least in that example, the exact result and the leading result aren't so far off. Um, but now to answer your question, what we're not strong enough to do is in an example with 113 moduli, do what Candela de Los Green and Parks did for the Quintic and write down the exact expression. Rather, we can only series expand it. Okay, right. got it. Sorry. That's why we have this stupid series expansion and we can take it as far as you want, but we can't write the full thing yet. We can't resub oh, okay. it. Okay, got it. So in principle, it's something one could do, but it's yeah, understandable not yeah, to do. Yeah, yeah, it's just that you know, in prin in principle, you could, and then Candelas did it for dimension one and two, and then nobody else did anything, as far as I can see, in compact models right, to first approximation. And, and here, you know, we're doing it. Uh, this is for one hundred and thirteen, and and this is at least how we were best able to do it. Yeah. And okay, um, let me let me not belabor the discussion of convergence, because there's one more interesting qualitative point to get to. So finally, we have some example. Um, you put all the pieces together, um, and the final vacuum energy, I'll just highlight that the final vacuum energy in the example for which I already showed you the super potential is 10 to the minus 144 in thank you notes. Now, let me, um, rather than going through any more details, just comment on the computability. Um, I mentioned at the beginning that the cost is not proportional to one over the vacuum energy. That kind of cost is what I would expect. I think one generally expects in like a busso polchinski type flux landscape, right? If you want to find something where there's a cancellation to one part in 10 to the n, you're going to have to try of order 10 to the n different things. But here, um, the n in question is, is h to one or twice h to one. It's like five or 10. It's not big enough. So how can we succeed at all? Well, that's something I explained in answer to, to a previous question, um, but I think it's worth writing it out. In a sort of buso poltinsky picture of a flex landscape, one has minus some large number lambda to the fourth plus a quadratic form involving vectors of flexes, Q, and uh, some quadratic form C that pairs them together. And then the idea is if the dimension N of the space is large and minus lambda to the fourth is a very negative number, you try and find things choices of Q for which the length of Q measured with the norm defined by C is almost exactly uh, lambda squared. Then you get an almost exact cancellation. But the thing is that clearly requires a lot of tries and provably uh, is, is uh, a complex problem. In our construction, there isn't such a perturbative piece, right? That's where we made an exact integer choice to zero that out. And this now comes back uh, in a way to Jamek's question about um, a super potential in which one is sort of spontaneously breaking the R symmetry by, by some exponentially small amount. In a sort of a way, that's what's happening here, right? We're dialing in by an exact choice of quantized data that everything that's polynomial is zero, and all that's left are exponentials. When all that's left are exponentials, well, when they compete against each other, either you get a runaway or you get something that's exponentially small. And we just found cases where you don't get a runaway, rather you get something that's exponentially small. And you just have to make a polynomial effort in tuning the integers to get an exponentially small vacuum energy. Okay. Um, I already said that these, these are measure zero in the Ben F. Douglas estimate. Now, just one closing remark before my conclusion slide. Although the effort involved in tuning the integers is, as I'm saying, polynomial, we actually had to work sort of hard to enumerate the possible integers, right? That's where the lifting went in, is making the sets of integer data in the first place. Once you've got them, it's pretty easy to fine tune them uh, by choice to get an exponential. We had to be able to do all these things automatically on a large scale. Um, and we, we hope to be able to do a lot more things with those tools uh, in the future. And since the final answers are expressed in terms of integers, you can verify an awful lot of it by hand. Not the convergence of the roll sheet instanton series. That's um, beyond hand work, but all the rest, as far as I can see. OK, so in conclusion, um, supersymmetric KKLT vacua are in the landscape. And the search is automated, so large-scale studies are possible. We can go far beyond. The burning question for the future is, can we uplift these to interesting disitter vacua? Thanks a lot. Thanks a lot, Liam. Are there more questions for Liam? Can I ask a quick question and then I'll have to actually run away? 
um, but but thanks for your talk. Um, there, there's some flux tadpole condition in general, right? So there's going to be some integer that comes out of the the the, the character of the fourfold, and um, and then you choose some fluxes, and those saturate some or all of the tadpole. And yeah. the part that you don't saturate that way, you will have to introduce other wandering objects, which a priori introduce other sectors, which a priori lead to more fields, which could do whatever the hell they do. Um, exactly. how, how did, you know, did you worry about this? I understand many answers to, to, you know, what I'm asking, but you know what I'm asking. I certainly do. Yeah. So let me show you the exact, the actual example. So our examples had varying character, but in this example, what you'll see, um, is that the number of D3 brains that we had to put in is four because the D3 brain tadpole in this geometry is 60. The D3 brain charge in the fluxes is 56. And so one needed four D3 brains. Now, where do you put them? they'll move because of a Ganor prefactor and sit somewhere. Now, if we had claimed that we knew the Fafian numbers exactly, like, you know, if Ashok computes those, then the Ganor prefactors coming from moving around D3 brains will spoil that knowledge and change it to some other order one thing. But one thing we do know from, in fact, from some of our works together is that the D3s are repelled from the D7 brain loci. So they sit somewhere away from them. So you know they won't in particular hit divisors and cause a vanishing of something that you've used. Yeah, and the reason for that is that if they're away, then you have a supersymmetric vacuum. And if they sit on it, you get a no scale configuration. So it costs energy to move them from yeah, away okay, from the fine. divisor. Yeah, just checking. OK. So yeah. So um, one thing you might also ask uh, is, well, what if a bunch of them clump together? Then you could get a contribution to the super potential from the D3 brain theory. But that requires some interaction with the bulk fluxes to give an important contribution. But yeah, we definitely worried about that. Do you have allowed tachyons in this theory? Um, one could. We didn't in these. So these are these are actually non-tachyonic. Um, and and uh, they're and they're absolutely stable. Is that correct? They're absolutely stable and and they are non-tachyonic. So if you could magically uplift them by adding a pure constant, then they would be stable still. I may be also, using it, but I don't know how to prove that they should always be like that. I, I think I think it's not clear that they should always be like that. They just happen to be so here. Okay, but that means there's also a, a CFT. I think there's a CFT. Yeah, yeah. Okay, I mean, as opposed to the ones where you know they can decay, in which case there's not. But these definitely cannot decay. Now I don't know anything about the CFTs. Um, it would be wonderful if one could figure out something. The problem is. Um, I don't yet know that they have striking enough structure. I mean, somehow, what do they have? You have the Planck scale, and they can lose a Klein scale just below it. And then you go really far down, and you get the uh, confinement. You get, yeah, you go way down, and you get the confinement scale, so some glue balls and stuff. And then way below that, and you get the ADS scale. And uh, I, I would love a suggestion about how that could be tested by bootstrap or something like that, but I don't know exactly how to do so. Well, you can always get somewhere by trading the flux from brains and stuff, so. Um, yeah, that's yeah. right. Um, that, but, that's something that actually we would love to be able to do is to make sort of a brain model of these particular flux choices, but we didn't do that yet. Yeah, they would trade for some five brains or intersecting or whatever. There'd be some 3D turn Simons couplings and all that. But it just it's just, yeah, it's good nice to know that that's predicted here. Thanks. Uh, sorry. So, so one thing that I think you hinted at or maybe even said, and I just didn't glom onto it enough, is it, it should I think of the Denif Douglas? distributions is qualitatively wrong because they miss stuff that happens when dominant terms in your prepotential or superpotential cancel due to these integral conditions? I wouldn't say, I wouldn't say qualitatively wrong because um, at least my own view, and this actually is quite related to Eva's question about, about stability. My own view of the Denif Douglas statements is, you know, you should trust those things toward the center of the distribution. And toward the center of the distribution, yeah. you don't find any discrepancies or anomalies. But now we're talking something that predicts a W off on the tail one. Should you go, you know, and it says there's nothing at 10 to the minus 60, and we say there is. Well, I mean, that was many, many sigma out on, on their tail. However, it is true that um, I mean it is it is strictly not right that the things that they claim that they would claim are disallowed are in fact disallowed. But that's that's naturally because you know, everything that they said was with the qualifier in the continuous flux approximation. And what we're doing is you know, something cool that you can do only with discrete fluxes. I think that's, that's maybe the coolest part in a way, other than realizing 
it, it, what was in my mind an old dream of of actually um, you know, making very explicit Palabiao uh, vacua with with small vacuum energy. Um, the cool thing is that this red line here is something exact, and so um, it does qualitatively change compared to DD. Okay, thank you. Maybe I can ask, you had this uh, sketch of a racetrack. I didn't quite get why the sum of two exponentials is related to what we call a racetrack on a track and field. What, yeah, what's the um, idea? Is there... Yeah, there's, I don't think there's a great reason. It, the, the terminology uh, is, is before my time, at least academically, although perhaps not biologically, but it's a very old idea. Um, you're just competing to, the exponentials are racing. It's, it's a race to the bottom. The two exponentials are racing to the bottom, but because one of them has a bigger prefactor and the other one has a slightly bigger exponent, at one point oh. one overtakes the other. It's let's say track is wrong, it's a race. Okay. Yeah, any other question? Well, I, I mean, if no one else does, I I'm still very interested in this whole discussion we often have, Liam, about which we touched on earlier about. The structures in the landscape versus some naive, generic, let's say random yeah. matrix picture. Um, and earlier you were explaining that you weren't getting saddle points in this region um, uh, because of supersymmetry. And, and curiously, you know, other regions that are generic in certain ways, you have rigidity properties that prevent um, tachyons also, even though if you're super naive, you might say, oh, it's all saddle points. And, um, so um, with all this work, I mean, you're, you're kind of the unique person that has worked on both deeply, right? <laughs> I mean, the, uh, do, you, do you see new ways to kind of distinguish the two? Um, that question makes sense. Yeah, it, it totally does. Um, I haven't seen far enough yet to answer that question. It's very much on my mind, but I have to do one intermediate step first. So somehow, like actually almost exactly 10 years ago, I, I gave a talk at Stanford about sort of random matrix instability type arguments. Um, and it, a couple for the couple of years after that, we were struggling with how can we really check these things? Well, it turned out you need more Calabiao data. But to get more Calabiao data that means anything for random matrix that you have to do that at large N. And computationally, the largest N that was accessible was like three or four. And so enter a period of some years in which we set out to actually develop the ability to build the random matrix models. But when we built them, what we found was actually most of the time we're not finding the generic things, we're first finding the Susie things. Well, of course, that's where most people's baby steps are, right, in, in supersymmetric land. And my remark about an intermediate thing is, is the following. Um, I feel like we need one more baby step, but it's possibly in a, too hard, which is to find um, some supersymmetric vacuum with a higher supersymmetry breaking scale, sort of sort of deeper minima. Because the reason that, that all this that the cosmological constant scale is small here is because all the scales are small. And, and so somehow that's not um, very illuminating about the general structure of the landscape. What we'd really like to know, at least I would like to know, is tell me something about properties of the landscape where the scale of supersymmetry breaking is not 10 to the minus 33 electron volts, but is a lot higher than that. And to do that, um, I would want to first find supersymmetric vacua with large depth. So like supersymmetric va super ADS vacua where the gravitino mass is big compared to present day Hubble. And, and then I might have enough confidence to venture up into like the high terrain where there's tons of saddles and maxima and stuff like that. Um, I don't yet know how to do that though. Is, is that going in the, in the direction of the, of the remark or? or yeah, I, I guess so. I mean, of course, um, that separation of scales happens immediately in other contexts. So I'm, I'm, less used, I'm less used to thinking about this in this way of organizing it. But again, there the rigidity is kind of analogous to your starting point with the positive masses, um, yeah. and, and then you can work work from that. But um, yeah, I, I mean, I think I see what you're saying in the, in the context you're working. Yeah, I would very much like to um, 
I mean, the long-term hope really is to, to um, understand enough at the sort of enumerative level in a bunch of different corners to start to make useful statements about like bulk behavior. And it's somehow like a cyclical process, right? Where like there were some enumerative results in the early 2000s and then statistical results sort of pairing with each other. And now I think there's just, you know, several more cycles of that are needed. Uh, well, yeah. before one can say much, much more. Yeah, yeah, although I, th I think in all cases, there is this just dumb three-term structure, okay? It's, it's there in the, these examples, it's there in the, um, let's say hyperbolic examples, whatever. It, it's always there. And the way you get low Hubble is you, you know, tune those discrete parameters, you know, one in one more respect uh, than you described here, that's it. And, um, yeah. and, and, you know, we do know how to do that in, uh, in some of these, compactifications where there are explicit manifolds and discrete quantum numbers and so on. Um, so I was just, yeah, I was just kind of musing about how to combine that with the, the uh, you know, contrast with um, a, a kind of information, you know, a kind of uh, uh, uninformative prior versus what we know now to be this, the structure of the landscapes. Um, anyway, maybe this is not interesting for everybody, so I'll stop, but it's uh, every time there's progress like this, it's interesting to ask this question, I think. Yeah, well, in fact, the, the point that you just raised about, you know, three terms and, and, and what needs one needs to do to get another scale, I think that's that's the clear next step here. And in fact, it's already, um, it's already sort of plain what one would like to do. It's to, um, this now does not go toward answering the particular question you asked about, like, what about saddles and instabilities, but rather the question, you know, get to sitter from these things, which, okay, which, okay, you can, you can do, we can't do here yet. Um, in fact, it we think it should be feasible um, via your work with Saltman, I mean, extending that to this setting. Just have a spontaneous breaking by an F term. Um, I don't see any obstacle. The, the trick is going to be actually doing it. And I think computationally, that'll be an order of magnitude harder than what we already did. But I think we can do it eventually, or should be able to do it eventually. I see. That sounds very interesting. Is there some reason? I mean, that that would conceptually work, but so would the anti-brain. Is there some reason you are doing yeah. one as opposed to the other? Oh here? well, I think we'll try and do both. But the reason I wouldn't do the anti-brain as a first choice is the following. Um, you know, there's something. Although there are plenty of places where you know one could wonder about parametric control of various things in, in what I talked about today almost all of it came down to topological questions, like, you know, what are the GV invariants? What maybe about multi-covers, but this is really about fundamentally holomorphic stuff. If you try to do the antibrain, so it would not cost me more than, I think, it would take us maybe a week of trouble or something like that to crank out some examples that have nice conifolds. We already written papers showing how to do that in this kind of setting. But you want one that has everything we already had plus a conifold. Okay, so that's a, you know, one more ask, maybe, factor of 10 increase in die rolls and you'll get it. Maybe a week is too optimistic, no problem getting it. The, I think that would be fun. But the trouble is you want to now put an antibrain or some number of antibrains in it. And to say, aha, this is a descender vacuum, um, you know, to find a throat where the warping is correct to give an uplift that looks metastable in the leading approximation where you write down the KPV potential and believe it, I don't think that's actually particularly hard. It's just, I don't think that would transform anyone's understanding of, of what's going on. It wouldn't be any more explicit than the stuff that was done in you know, 2003, say, um, because this one, ple this one piece of really checking how the anti-brain back reacts um, you know, is a complicated PDE question. And I don't think, I think this would be melding together something that we have here that's extremely explicit and controlled with something that's just like, eh, probably works. And um, I think, some people are going to have to sweat a lot to make an anti-brain in a throat as controlled as like some computation of the super potential. But what if we just found, you know, a slightly more complicated super potential that breaks Susie by an F term? Then the conversation is still about, you know, a holomorphic function determined by topology. That's, I think, in a more favorable regime for doing something um, solid. That's, okay, why, that's why I like to do it that way. Okay, great. Yeah, that was the hope, but we, we certainly didn't do it in detail. Thanks. Okay, um, one final round, last call.
Okay, uh, if no more questions, let's thank Liam again for the very nice talk. Thanks a lot. Thanks, Liam.